Yo, what is going on, Fantasy Addicts? I'm your host, That Fantasy Addict, and today, as you can tell, we are going to be looking over wide receivers going into their second year this season. Now, if you haven't already seen my last video, we covered five sophomore receivers in that video, and that is the first one of this series. This is part two, and there will be a part three tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that part three, and if you haven't already seen the very first video that I uploaded, I do recommend that you watch that video before because I did order around the receivers in the assumption that you will be watching the first video first, second video second, and third video third. So it will make a little more sense if you watch the first video before this video. I will have the link to that video in the description below. With that being said, for those of you who have already seen that video, let's get right into this, this one, part two. So first up, we have DK Metcalf, wide receiver for the Seattle Seahawks. Now, DK Metcalf, one of his biggest strengths is his size, right? He's 6'3", 228. He's built bigger than any other cornerback there is. He's also extremely athletic, and he's shredded. He can bully any defender on him. If we look at his workout metrics here, we see that he ran a 4'3", 40-yard dash, which was in the 99th percentile. Same with his speed score, which basically just takes his 40-yard dash and adjusts it for his size. So if he was in the 90th percentile 40-yard dash, the speed score might be 95th percentile since he's so big and they're comparing him to other people about his size. But he was already in the 99th percentile in 40-yard dash, so there was no room there in percentile for speed score. His burst score is in the 97th percentile and his catch radius is in the 91st percentile. So all of those workout metrics are phenomenal. Now, also, Russell Wilson went from 62 red zone passes in 2018 all the way up to 89 red zone passing attempts in 2019. Yes, this team still does like to run. Pete Carroll always has and always will. But they are adapting more to the passing game, at least last year. And I do expect that to continue on this season because... They have some weapons, and they drafted DK Metcalf last season. They clearly want to be using receivers more in the passing game for sure, so they should be keeping that up, increasing their amount of passing attempts in the red zone and not relying on the run as much as they used to. That's obviously very good for DK Metcalf because he is the biggest receiver on this team. He is phenomenal in the red zone, and if there are a lot of red zone passing attempts going around, DK Metcalf should be getting a good amount of them. Now, DK Metcalf scored seven touchdowns last year with a very moderate red zone target share. It was only 21.4%. Now, that number should go up, right? There's not too much competition on the Seahawks. Of course, there, there are some other pieces for sure, but it's not insane there's not Travis Kelsey on that team. It's not like Mike Evans is on that team, right? DK Metcalf should, in theory, be the number one red zone target, although there are still some other targets that the Seahawks do have. From weeks eight on, DK Metcalf actually played over 90% of the team's snaps five separate times. However, between weeks one to seven, he never played over 90% of the team's snaps. In fact, he only played over 80% of the team's snaps twice. So clearly, as they saw DK Metcalf making major strides forward, they were using him more. That's a problem with some rookies. Some rookies don't get the high level of usage that they should be getting. But DK Metcalf, it wasn't an issue. The Seahawks were using him more and more as the season went on. So there's no reason why that should not continue into the season. In fact, from weeks eight on, Metcalf actually had a 63.3 catch percentage, much better than his 50% catch percentage from weeks 1 to 7. Now, he did only average 13.45 yards per reception from weeks 8 on, and he did average 19.45 yards per reception between weeks 1 to 7, but he had 5 touchdowns from week 8 on, and only 2 touchdowns between weeks 1 to 7. Not only that, but he actually had more red zone targets in week in weeks 1 to 7 than week 8 to 17. So in theory, he should have had more touchdowns in weeks 1 to 7, 
but he didn't because he was just becoming that much better. Also, he was 16th in yards per reception, which is pretty good generally, but especially for a rookie, that is very, very good. Having 15.5 yards per reception with a 58-point catch rate, which isn't awful as a rookie, is pretty solid. Those are some very good numbers as a rookie. DK Metcalf even thrived when it came to contested catches, catching 47.6% of the contested balls going his way. That put him 14th in the NFL in that category. That's something that a lot of rookies struggle with, but not DK Metcalf. He showed tremendous signs of being able to eye a ball in the air and coming down with it. That's something that I'm very excited about, seeing from how he progresses to being pretty good when it comes to contested catches, to hopefully being one of the best in the league next year, or I should say, this upcoming season. There are some things that we need to be cautious about when drafting DK Metcalf, though. For example, Greg Olson, Will Disley, and Jacob Hollister. All of those are pretty capable tight ends, especially in the red zone. They're all there. Also, even after DK Metcalf was producing in the red zone and proving that he knew how to adjust his game when he was in squish situations in the red zone, they still decided to not throw to him in the red zone that much between weeks 10 to 16. In fact, even though right before that time period he was going off in the red zone, they only threw him one target in the red zone between weeks 10 to 16. They clearly are not forcing themselves to get him the ball in the red zone because they have Chris Carson, they have Rashad Penny, they have good running backs, and they have other weapons that they can use. And especially considering that they love to run the ball, they are not scared of just giving it to Carson three times in a row on the goal line, which could take away a lot of points from DK Metcalf. Also, DK Metcalf had the 103rd best true catch rate, which is just awful. So he had the 77th best catch rate, which isn't good to start with. But then once you add in the fact that almost all of his targets were pretty good, when you take away the few bad targets that he had, and you take away the bad targets that everyone else had, now his true catch rate is a lot worse than his regular catch rate. And if you don't know what true catch rate is, it's basically calculated by just dividing the amount of receptions by the amount of catchable targets. So catch rate, regular catch rate, is just receptions divided by targets, but true catch rate just eliminates the uncatchable targets since it gives an advantage to players with good quarterbacks and it puts players with awful quarterbacks at a disadvantage since the regular catch rate is adding in uncatchable targets that there is no one in the world who could catch. Now, once again, The Seattle Seahawks are a very run-heavy team. When they can run the ball, they ideally want to. So when the Seahawks get off to an early lead, which will happen in multiple games, they are not scared to just start running the ball everywhere. That could really, really hurt DK Metcalf's production on a weekly basis. And last but certainly not least, DK Metcalf ranked 63rd in target premium. That basically shows that in comparison to his teammates, he wasn't that productive. And that kind of explains why Russell Wilson at times was a little hesitant to throw to him. He definitely preferred throwing to Tyler Lockett and other players like Will Disley before he got injured in the red zone as opposed to DK Metcalf. Now, with all this being said, do I think he is worth the pick? Well, he, per fantasydata.com, which I will leave a link to in the description below, Per FantasyData.com's PPR average draft position, or ADP for short, DK Metcalf is going as the wide receiver 18, or a late fourth round pick. Now, as a late fourth round pick, I think he's okay, but looking at the other wide receivers that are available, at this time, you can get Robert Woods for most likely a quarter or a half a round later than DK Metcalf. You can also get Calvin Ridley around the same time, And I like both of those players more than DK Metcalf. So yes, as a late fourth round pick, if there's no one else available, I wouldn't be too concerned about him. But there are other players with much higher upside and a much higher chance of reaching that upside than DK Metcalf. Calvin Ridley is someone who 
I really think has an extraordinarily high chance of being a top six or seven wide receiver. I really think it's over one third. I think that there's a phenomenal chance he absolutely breaks out and I would much rather have him than DK Metcalf. Now, that was in redraft, right? Calvin Ridley, much better in redraft. Robert Woods, much better in redraft, in my opinion. In Dynasty, I do think he's a very good option. He is very talented. He has a few things to work on, clean up his game and everything, work on his route running, work on his agility, but overall, he has a lot of potential in the near future. So for Dynasty, I do think he's an okay pick, and I wouldn't be too hesitant to take him. However, in best ball leagues, people think that on a week-to-week basis, he's going to be pretty boom or bust, or at least have a lot of potential every single week. And I don't think that's the case. Yes, he might not be the most consistent player, which is pretty good in best ball, because if you know best ball, you know that that's a relatively good thing that you want to target. So even though he might be less consistent than the average player, I don't think he's going to have so many boom weeks and just absolutely light the league on fire every other week. I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's safer than most people think, which is not something that I want in best ball leagues. So I'm definitely staying away from him in best ball. In redraft, for the right price, possibly, if no one else is available. And in dynasty, I think he's an average pick. So that was DK Metcalf, but... Let's get into another player that doesn't have as much hype as he does. He goes by the name of Hunter Renfro for the now Las Vegas Raiders. So once again, this ADP is per fantasydata.com. All of the ADPs in this video and for the rest of these videos that are about second year wide receivers, the ADP in all of them is per fantasydata.com, their PPR average draft position. I will leave, once again, a link to that website in the description below. So Hunter Renfro, per fantasydata.com, is going as the wide receiver 62, or roughly a mid-14th round pick. And when it's a mid-14th round pick, that basically means that they're going anywhere in between the 12th round to undrafted. Because when your ADP is in the third round, it's not like people are drafting you in the first round and the sixth round, right? When you're that high up into the in the early stages of the draft, their ADPs are are pretty much where they're being drafted. So for the later rounds, it's their average draft position, but it's definitely not where they're being drafted every time. People are not afraid to reach on them. People are not afraid to just not draft them as a whole. But his average draft position, nonetheless, is a mid-14th round pick. So some good things about Hunter Renfro is that he's very shifty and agile. We see that in his agility score, he's in the 76th percentile there. That's very key to a good slot receiver, right? He played 66.8% of his snaps in the slot. He is a slot receiver, and that's where he thrives. Agility is important for good slot receivers. You look at some of the better slot receivers in the game, they're all very shifty and agile. Now, Hunter Renfro also should be on an above average, maybe average team this year. The Las Vegas Raiders, I do like them this season. Jalen Rashard is a solid receiving back. Derek Carr is making strides forward. He's not looking like he used to be for sure, but he's looking better. Josh Jacobs looks very, very good. And they had a decent draft, at least for offense, which we'll get into later. So he's on a good team that should score more points than they did this last season. So that's a good thing for him. Also, he was 8th in hog rate and 17th in fantasy points per route run. Essentially, this is just showing that even though he wasn't used that much, when he was, he was pretty good. When he was on the field running routes, he was doing very good. They just weren't putting him on the field that much. And we can see that through his being ranked 110th in snap share and 83rd in route participation. They didn't use him as much as they probably should have. Also, between weeks 1 to 7, he had a very bad 53.8 catch rate and a horrendous 8.21 yards per reception. However, 
from week eight on, he had a phenomenal 77.8 catch percentage and 14 yards per reception right on the dot. Now, that is phenomenal. That is literally MVP numbers right there. Of course, I don't expect that efficiency to stay into all of this season because it's just not sustainable. However, it does show that he was pretty good last year. Also, he had all four of his touchdowns on the entire season in that span of week eight on. So he clearly got a lot better and showed massive improvement in the second half of the season. While yes, there are certainly a lot of things to like about him, I do have a lot of concerns for him going into this season. He had the 51st best true catch rate. So while his catch rate might have been the 16th best due to him being a slot receiver, meaning that he runs oftentimes shorter routes and gets a higher catch percentage, therefore, and also because he had Derek Carr throwing on the ball, who was actually better than most people think, right? Hunter Renfro's catchable target rate was number seven. So that was certainly very good. So he had good passes. So his 16th catch rate actually makes sense. But his true catch rate was ranked 51st in the league, which is not that great. It's not awful, but it's nothing special. He also turned 10 red zone targets into just two touchdowns. That's pretty bad. That is not something that you like to see, especially from someone who is competing with other players in the red zone. And that leads me into my next point, which is how much competition there is in Las Vegas. They still have Darren Waller, they still have Jalen Richard, and they still have Tyrell Williams. Those are all players who are capable of having a good amount of receiving touchdowns, even Jalen Richard, because he is a receiving back. Darren Waller is one of the elite tight ends in the league, and Tyra Williams is pretty big. They all have a lot of potential in the red zone. It's going to be hard for Hunter Renfro to get his fair share of targets in the red zone when he's only converting 10 targets in the red zone to just two touchdowns. Not to mention, they brought in quite a few pieces this offseason. Jason Witten is now there, who's a pretty good backup tight end, I would say. He's backing up Darren Waller. Not to mention, they used the 12th overall pick in the 2020 NFL Draft on Henry Ruggs. They used the 81st overall pick on Brian Edwards. Both of those guys are some very, very good prospects. They even used the 80th overall pick on utility player Lynn Bowen, who played running back, wide receiver, quarterback, and return man. I'm not as scared about him affecting Hunter Renfro's red zone targets as I am about the other players, but it still is something to know that he should be on the field a decent amount. But all those players collectively are really going to be going at it competing for red zone targets. And I'm afraid that Hunter Renfro is not in a position where we can expect him to be outperforming all those guys in the red zone. We saw last year he wasn't that great in the red zone, even though he was pretty good everywhere else. Also, he was 34th in points per target, fantasy points per target, that is, which is not awful, especially for a rookie, but it means that he can't rely on big plays like some other guys can. Some other guys, even if there's a lot of competition, if they had four or five targets a game, they could turn two of those into big plays. Well, Hunter Renfro can't. He needs a lot of targets. He's a slot guy. That's usually how slot receivers are. They have good catch percentages, are pretty solid in the red zone, and don't have many fantasy points per target, but they get a lot of targets. Look at Juju Smith-Schuster, right? Two seasons ago, when he broke out, he had a ton of targets, I think around 150 of them. That's why he was so good, because he catches the majority of the balls that go his way, and the Steelers got on the ball whenever they could. That's not happening with the Raiders due to all that competition. He needs to be getting a lot of targets, but Hunter Renfro will not be getting that many targets, unfortunately. Also, as the season went on, they really just showed no signs of wanting to use Hunter Renfro more. This is what we talked about with DK Metcalf. The Seahawks were using DK Metcalf more as the season went on because they saw he was becoming very, very good. The Raiders didn't do this with Hunter Renfro. Doesn't mean that they necessarily 
will do the same thing and just not use them anymore this season? No, not necessarily. They could, just as a lot of teams do. But the fact that they brought in Jason Witten and used three picks on three wide receivers, one of them being a utility player, of course, that just shows that they're not very confident in Hunter Renfro, especially in the red zone where it matters most and where you get the most fantasy points. So while being on an average team might actually be good for receivers because it means that they're going to be in the game and they're going to be on a decent offense, but they still might be losing a lot of the games, so they'll be throwing a lot. This team is going to go run heavy whenever possible. Whenever they're winning, they want to use Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs is the player who they are going to give the ball to whenever possible. And not to mention, if Carr thrives with his variety of weapons that he has now, this team could easily go 9-7. and seven. I'm not saying that they will. I'd probably take the under on that. But there's a good chance they go 9-7 and seven or even better. And if they do that, they're going to be just like the Titans. Give the running back the ball whenever possible. So, would I draft Hunter Renfro as the wide receiver 62 mid-14th round pick, a.k.a. anywhere between the 12th round and undrafted? Now, I do think there's a decent chance he returns value. And looking at the other guys being drafted around him, I think he's probably safer than them. Doing all this research, I still believe that there is a good chance he returns value and finishes as the wide receiver 56 or the wide receiver 57 or whatever. There's a good chance he finishes better than the wide receiver 62. So there is a very, very select few teams that I would actually endorse drafting Hunter Renfro. These teams are the teams that have good receivers, but not a lot of them, and who, yeah, good receivers, very good receivers, very reliable receivers, but not too many of them. So, for example, if you have Devontae Adams, Robert Woods, and that's your main core, and maybe you have, I don't know, Marvin Jones, who I like um, as a third as a third wide receiver, even though I like Marvin Jones... We don't know that he's going to be good, but I still do like him, as I like Devontae Adams, as I like Robert Woods. But there's three receivers right there and no one else. If you're in the 12th, 13th round with no wide receiver, and you don't need to draft a boomer bust player, a player, a rookie who could be really good but could be awful, because the chances are none of them are going to outperform Devontae Adams or Robert Woods. You don't need that breakout player. You just need someone to fill in on the very few weeks that you have buys with your starters or on the few weeks where injuries occur, right? If you draft a boomer bust rookie, there's a good chance you're just going to drop him. In fact, it's more than likely. So if he hits and he's pretty good, it probably doesn't matter because you already have Robert Woods and Devontae Adams and Marvin Jones starting over him. All that you need is someone to fill in when you need another wide receiver And that is what Hunter Renfro can do. You are pretty sure that he's going to return value and be better than the wide receiver 62. Now, there's a good chance he doesn't, but there is a solid chance that he does return value. And if you don't have that many good wide receivers, don't take Hunter Renfro because he doesn't have the potential to be 15 plus PPR points per game this season. But he does certainly have the potential to be a safe player that can fill in in your bye weeks. So unless you have two or three really good wide receivers, don't be taking Hunter Renfro. There's no point. There's just better wide receivers available who have more upside. This is the same thing for Dynasty. I don't think Hunter Renfro is that good. I don't think the situation is that great. Of course, he could be in a better situation in a few years, but nonetheless, I don't think he's phenomenal and I know some people are charging quite a quite a lot for Hunter Renfro and in best ball there is no reason at all no matter what to draft Hunter Renfro because he is never going to score 30 points in a game well now that I said that he probably will but 
there's just such a minimal chance that he has multiple games where he goes off, and that's what you need in best ball. Even if you have Devontae Adams, Julio Jones, and Michael Thomas, and that's it, well, that that's it, meaning you only have three wide receivers. Obviously, they're great, but if you only have three wide receivers in redraft, maybe Hunter Renfro is worth it. In best ball, don't even bother because he's never going to go off, or at least he won't go off in more than one or two games. So that's my opinion on Hunter Renfro. I hope he does good, but I just think the situation is not ideal at all. However, the third and final player in this video certainly has a lot of hype, just as DK Metcalf does. And all I'm going to say right now is that I'm a little higher on him than I am with Hunter Renfro. His name is AJ Brown. He is receiving a lot of hype and a good amount of hate as well. So where do I stand on this? Now, we can look at his athletic profile, and it's pretty good, right? 69th percentile, 40-yard dash. That's He's in the 90th, 90th percentile for speed score, 55th percentile burst score, 48th percentile agility score, and 64th percentile catch radius. He was also in the 74th percentile in college target share, and 70th percentile in college yards per reception. And he was above the 50th percentile in both college dominator and breakout age. So that is pretty good. And those college metrics are, they're, they're pretty good. They're, they show that he definitely has potential to be very, very good. Of course, college metrics aren't everything, but they are a fairly reliable indicator of success in the NFL. Now, just like in our last video, Terry McLaurin was one wide receiver pick behind Debo Samuel. A.J. Brown is one wide receiver pick behind D.K. Metcalf. He is going as the wide receiver 19 as also a late fourth round pick. And by the way, if you once again, if you haven't seen my first video on second year wide receivers, I do advise you go watch that video. Now that you're already two thirds into this video, you might as well finish this one and then go watch that other video after this. But I definitely do advise you watch that video. I actually did five players in that. There's only three players in this one, so there is more content in that video. And I think you definitely have a lot to learn from that video. So like I said, A.J. Brown is one wide receiver pick after D.K. Metcalf. He's the wide receiver 19. So A.J. Brown, or I should say the Titans as a whole, have the 12th easiest strength of schedule per pro football focus which I will leave a link to that website in the description below. So AJ Brown was ranked 65th in snap share and 72nd in route participation. Now there are some players who weren't used as much as they should have, but AJ Brown is just on a whole nother level. He was one of the best wide receivers last year, if we're being honest, and he was not used a lot at all. This is a really good thing looking at his production in relation to his awful snap shirt and route participation because this season that number should go up he should be in the top 15 in both of those so imagine what he can do playing the majority of the snaps absolutely lethal now also he had a 22.6 percent target share with ryan Tannehill at quarterback and a 19.5 percent target share on the season as a whole with Tannehill and mariota combined I think this is really good because Tannehill clearly liked A.J. Brown more than Marcus Mariota did, so we know that Tannehill will be relying on A.J. Brown, but the number wasn't so high, 22.6% of the targets is not that crazy, which means that that number should go up a fairly good amount. It should be at least 24, 25, probably around 26, maybe 26.5% of the targets. And that's a very good amount, especially considering how efficient he is. He was sixth in the entire league in yards after catch as a rookie. That is phenomenal. You know that any single target he can take to the house. So even if he only has three or four targets, that could still be 20 points in a game easily for him. He was also second in yards per route run and second in yards per target and he was also third in yards per reception. All of these numbers are phenomenal. Could it go down this season? Yeah, but it's probably not going to be outside of the top 10. 
he was really, really good in this category, and I don't expect it to change that much. He was also 90th in drop rate, so drop rate is something that is a little concerning for rookies. A lot of rookies really struggle with that. Not for A.J. Brown, so we don't need to be worrying about that going into this season because it wasn't an issue last season. He was also second in fantasy points per target and in fantasy points per route run. So even if he's not running a ton of routes, which he should be, he should be running a lot of routes, but even if he's not, it's okay because on those routes, he's really making the best of it. But I do think that he will be running a lot of routes for sure next year, so that shouldn't even matter. He was third in quarterback rating when targeted, so keep in mind that Mariota was throwing him passes for about a third of the season. He was atrocious last year. So this isn't quarterback rating when targeted for just Ryan Tannehill. This is Tannehill and Mariota combined. Mariota was awful, so being third in quarterback rating when targeted says a lot about how good he was last season. A.J. Brown was also very good in the red zone, but he wasn't reliant on red zone targets, and that's exactly what we like to see. Despite being 42nd in red zone receptions and 41st in red zone targets, he turned just eight red zone targets into five catches, and four of those were touchdowns. However, the majority of his touchdowns actually came from not only outside of the red zone, but from over 50 yards. He had five touchdowns of more than 50 yards, and two of them were actually more than 80 yards. So it's great that he was good in the red zone, because if they use him in the red zone, which they should be, he could easily be in store for 12, 13, 14 touchdowns. But if they don't, it's okay because his touchdown number wasn't too reliant on red zone targets. Just eight red zone targets. It's not going to get any worse than that this season. So even if he keeps the exact same red zone targets, the the exact same amount of red zone targets, he should still have nine touchdowns, maybe even double digit touchdowns. So he's not reliant on red zone targets, but when he gets those targets, he definitely makes the most of them. Now, Derrick Henry, of course, is the Titans' first red zone option. A lot of people are concerned about this. But here's the thing, you shouldn't be. Even though he is their first red zone option, and Jonu Smith is also a solid tight end red zone player, A.J. Brown only had eight red zone targets last year, and he converted four of those into touchdowns. There's no way that he's going to get less than eight red zone targets this upcoming season. So even if Derrick Henry still is, their number one priority in the red zone. It doesn't matter because A.J. Brown will have a good amount of touchdowns in the red zone, and even if he doesn't, he's probably going to have five, maybe six, maybe more than that touchdowns outside of the red zone. So it's completely okay. He's not dependent on being in the red zone eight times every single game. That's just not what he relies on, and that's a very good thing. Not to mention, even with just eight red zone targets... He ranked third in the NFL in total touchdowns. Once again, he had nine of them. He does not need red zone targets at all, although it definitely would help. It helps everyone. Now, with Derrick Henry being the focal point of this offense, defenses can't just focus on A.J. Brown all game. Even though he's so talented, the Titans probably aren't going to use A.J. Brown as much as Derrick Henry. Defenses have to be paying attention to Derrick Henry because whenever the Titans can, they're getting him the ball. So that's going to relieve a lot of pressure away from A.J. Brown. And that's good because even if the Titans do use Derrick Henry more than A.J. Brown, which they probably will, if A.J. Brown has four catches in a game, he could easily make that four for 150 and two touchdowns. Now, of course, I want him to have more than four catches in a game, But even if Derrick Henry is the focal point of this offense, it doesn't change the fact that A.J. Brown in fantasy football could still go off that week. But defenses aren't going to care because they care more about real life than fantasy, and they know that the ball is going to Derrick Henry the majority of the time. Yes, there is so much to like about A.J. Brown, but just like all the other players, we do have to know 
some of the concerns about A.J. Brown going into this season before we draft him. So he is very boomer bust on a weekly basis. Now, if you're only a best ball player, this doesn't even matter, right? I mean, of course you'd rather him boom every week, but no one does that. So boomer bust, if you're in a best ball league, it doesn't matter in that. But in regular fantasy football, redraft or dynasty, regular redraft, not best ball that is, boomer bust is not the best thing. Now, if you're drafting someone in the first round who's boomer bust, that could be a concern. But remember, A.J. Brown is a fourth round pick, a late fourth round pick. So that is something that often comes with a lot of these early, mid, or late, early draft picks, right? Late fourth round, not one of your top picks, but not quite a mid-round pick. So also, if the Titans got off to an early lead, there is pretty much no way that they have any game plan in their mind other than the give the rock to Derrick Henry game plan. That's all they are thinking about if they have a two-touchdown lead. And they should have a two-touchdown lead in a few games. They're a pretty good team. So we do need to be cautious about that, even though A.J. Brown, once again, can turn three targets into three catches for 120 yards and a touchdown. That's not always going to happen. And if he has three targets because they got off to an early lead, a lot of times that's going to be two for 20. Also, a good defense might hurt A.J. Brown because even though for many wide receivers it's good because it means that they have better field position, which means that they're in the red zone more often, which means that they're getting more red zone targets, A.J. Brown is actually probably better when not in the red zone because he still scores so many touchdowns outside of the red zone and he has so many more yards and the team gives him the ball more there than inside the red zone. In the red zone, it's either Derrick Henry or if they're passing it, a lot of times it'll go to Jonu Smith this season. But when they're not in the red zone, yes, Derrick Henry still is the focal point of this offense, but A.J. Brown probably has a bigger role there and can still easily score touchdowns. Not to mention, a good defense usually means a pretty good team, and if they're a pretty good team, you know that the Titans are just going to give Derrick Henry the ball, which means that A.J. Brown does not have the ball. Last, but most certainly not least, would you say that quarterback play matters for a wide receiver in fantasy football? Because I sure would. And yes, Ryan Tannehill was good last year, but there still is some uncertainty with how good he's going to be this year. Last year, he broke out. Sure. But could it be a one-year wonder? I'm not saying that it is, but it still is a little skeptical that he had a lot of seasons as being a below-average starter and eventually being benched, and then all of a sudden breaking out and being phenomenal. Now, he might be even better this season than he was last season, but what if he returns to how he was when he used to be a starter? In 2014, 2015, those seasons are not the seasons that we want to be seeing Ryan Tannehill throw to our late fourth round pick. So we do have to know that there's a chance that the quarterback play is not nearly as good as it was last year. With all that being said, what do I think of A.J. Brown? Well, in best ball, I absolutely love him. People know that he's boomer bust, so people are drafting him higher in best ball than in regular redraft fantasy football, but I don't think that they're drafting him as early as they should be. I love him. Every other week, you're getting a 20-plus point performance. It truly is phenomenal. Best ball, I love him. Dynasty, I also love him. Yes, he had a pretty good quarterback last year, but even without Ryan Tannehill, it was clear that he would have been good, right? And he was on an offense that didn't get him the ball that much. When he's on, if he ever is on a different situation, it's probably going to be a better situation. We know how talented he is. One day he'll probably be a top five receiver in terms of talent. And I think that people aren't really thinking about that when they're drafting or trading for for AJ Brown in dynasty leagues. So I'm a huge fan of him in dynasty. In redraft, I'm the lowest on him in comparison to dynasty and best ball. 
but I'm still pretty high on him. I'm not going to take him in every league, but whenever he falls to me as a late fourth round pick, unless Calvin Ridley is there, I am most certainly looking at A.J. Brown. I have no problem having him in several leagues. I think his ADP is great. Yes, he might not return value, but he also might be a top five, top eight wide receiver. And I think that is a risk that I am definitely willing to take, especially from someone who did so good last year as a rookie. The sky is the limit for this guy. So I definitely love him in all formats, but especially Dynasty and Best Ball, but even regular redraft. I'm still a big fan of him, and I have no problem drafting him at his ADP or even earlier as a mid-fourth round pick, maybe even an early fourth round pick if it comes down to it. So that is everything, guys. I really hope you enjoyed that video. Now, I will have one more video, which will be probably three, maybe four or five of the remaining sophomore wide receivers heading into 2020. By the way, if you enjoyed this video, I do put out a lot more content on Twitter than I do on YouTube. So definitely go give me a follow on Twitter if you like this content, because there's a whole lot more on my Twitter account. I will link that in the description. And other than that, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, leave a like. I, I don't like asking for likes, but when I'm just starting out, it is hard to gain that traction that I really need. So I really appreciate anyone and everyone who leaves a like, subscribes to me, leaves a comment down below. I make sure to respond to everyone. So I appreciate all my supporters. Thank you so very much for watching this video. Stay tuned because there will be a part three. And once again, if you haven't already seen my first video on this subject, second year wide receivers, definitely go check out that video because there's actually five receivers that I cover in that video. So there's more content in that video than there was in this video. So if you enjoyed this video, you're definitely going to like that one. That's all guys. And I hope you guys have a great day. Peace.